Imagine a professional athlete who thinks to himself, I'm so amazing. I'm so talented. I don't need to improve. I don't need to practice. I'm way beyond that. Well, we know that would be ridiculous. Professional athletes look for ways to improve their game. They want to increase their strength. They want to increase their speed and their endurance. Well, who do they look to for advice? Who do they look to for inspiration? How do they improve? Well, they look to those who have a proven track record, those who can help him with experience. Coaches, maybe personal trainer, or successful athletes in their particular sport. And once they listen to them, they want to do more than that. They want to look intently at what they're training them to do. They want to follow their example. That will strengthen them, that will speed them up, and it will help them to endure. Yes, they want to put into practice what they just were shown. Now, for us, we're not professional athletes, but we are dedicated Christians, and we have entered a race. In fact, the Apostle Paul, in Hebrews chapter 12, likens Christians to running a race for life. Yes, he used this illustration, illustration over 2,000 years ago. It's worked for 2,000 years, so let's keep using it. Uh, like an athlete, we want to look for ways that we can strengthen our faith, that we can look for ways that we can speed up our spiritual activity and that we can endure. How can we improve? Who can we look to for inspiration and for advice? Well, we can look at past runners, those who faithfully endured, much like those that the Apostle Paul mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. With their strong faith, we want to follow their example. Yes, they had strong faith in God's promises, but they did not have all the details of what those promises actually meant when it came to the Messiah or about the kingdom. So in a sense, their faith was incomplete or imperfect. But that didn't stop them from running a successful race to the finish. What helped them? They focused on what they did know, and that strengthened their faith, their hope, and that reward that would lie ahead in the kingdom. Now today, we don't have all the answers. We don't know all the details to Jehovah's promises. But we have much more than our faithful runners from the past. And what we do know helps us focus on what we have now, the joys, but also look forward with faith and with hope to our future reward under God's kingdom. So it's very beneficial to look at those in God's word, the Bible, as good examples. But why not look at a perfect example, one with a perfect track record that gives perfect advice? the perfect form, the perfect mindset, the perfect techniques. Who do we look to? Notice what the Apostle Paul said at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. I think you know who we're looking at, and that's Jesus. There in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2, it reads, Look intently at the chief agent and perfecter of our faith, Jesus. For the joy that was set before him he endured a torture stake, despising shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Did you notice that the Apostle Paul did not just say, look at Jesus? He said, look intently at him. What does that mean to look intently? It means to focus, to concentrate. Other definitions, to direct one's attention without distraction. Look away from one thing to see another. One reference said this about the ancient runners in Greece. The minute the Greek runner in the stadium takes his attention away from the race and from the goal to which he is speeding and turns it upon the onlooking crowds, his speed is slackened. It is so with a Christian. Isn't that true? We could be running a good race and then we get distracted onto something else? Well, here the Apostle Paul said Jesus is our chief agent, which can also mean our chief leader. 
It's been said a leader is one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. Yes, Jesus showed us the perfect way, the perfect course to follow. So if we follow it today, tomorrow, and forever, we know that we will draw close to Jehovah and we will be happy. So looking intently at our chief agent, our chief leader, Jesus, requires more than just studying him. It requires imitating him, following his lead, following in his footsteps so that we can run a successful race. Now, while Jesus was on earth, he fulfilled everything that the Bible foretold about the coming Messiah. In a sense, he completed faith. This established a firm foundation for which we can build our faith. We can make it complete. Now, we try to follow Jesus' footsteps as close as possible, but because we're imperfect, we often fail. So, do you get tired at times trying to run the race for life with all these distractions and pressures that come upon us? Does it seem like sometimes we're running a constant race going uphill? Do you sometimes feel like a failure, like giving up? I know I have in the past. We're not alone. We know that the course that we're on is a difficult one. We know the right way to go but it's difficult to go that right way. Such feelings can distract us. It could discourage us from making further spiritual progress. Who can we turn to for advice, for inspiration? Well, the Apostle Paul told us that we should look intently at Jesus. He knows our struggles. He knows how to help us. He knows what kind of hurdles or roadblocks will come before us, and he can help us to overcome them. Let's discuss four potential roadblocks. Here are the four. Number one, when we commit a sin. Secondly, when we suffer the loss of loved ones. Third, when we are pressured to compromise our faith. And the fourth, when we have doubts. Let's go to that first point. How does our compassionate High Priest Jesus Help us to overcome our first potential roadblock when we sin. Well, we might be running a very good race, a good pace, and then we do what other sinners do, what we do. We might trip. We might fall into sin. And when that happens, we're so discouraged. Uh, sometimes we feel like not getting up, that we're not able to follow in Jesus' footsteps, that we let Jehovah and Jesus down again, and maybe that we're unworthy of even having forgiveness or Jehovah's love. Now, we might feel that way at times, but that's not how Jehovah and his loving son Jesus feel about us. They know us better than we know ourselves. They know our strengths. They know our weaknesses. They know what we excel at and what we struggle with. And they love us anyway. They love us for what we can do, what we are doing, despite our limitations and despite our sinful conditions. Doesn't it calm your heart? I know it does for me to know that someone knows where I came from, where I am now, and, and where I need to go, and they want to help me. It really helps to know that they know our every anxious thought or sigh. Yes, Jehovah. And Jesus promised to be right at our side, to stand by us, to run with us and pick us up if we fall so we can keep running forward successfully. But remember, it's not the speed, it's the direction. Steady progress forward is what we need to remember. And our loving Father Jehovah and his son will help us do that. How thankful we are that our sympathetic High Priest Jesus extends the benefits of the ransom sacrifice to all obedient mankind. And remember, the ransom was not paid so much because we're so worthy, but because we are so loved by Jehovah and Jesus. Let's read those reassuring words for us at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. 
Here the Apostle Paul says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tested in all respects as we have, but without sin. Let us then approach the throne of undeserved kindness with freeness of speech, so that we may have mercy and find undeserved kindness to help us at the right time. What a beautiful scripture. How reassuring for every single one of us. So when we think about Jesus, when he was a human here on earth, he was exposed to all kinds of circumstances and influences that previously he only observed from the heavens. But now he was able to experience these as a human, feeling the emotions, feeling uh, firsthand the feelings of a human. Yes, he was tested in all respects and faithfully endured without sin perfectly. Yes, Jesus was a perfect man, but his experiences as a human on earth made him complete, perfected in all things. This equipped him to be our compassionate, merciful, faithful high priest who can certainly sympathize with our weaknesses. How reassuring. Jesus opens the way for us to approach Jehovah with freeness of speech. This means speech without limitations, without any restrictions on what we want to talk about or how long we want to talk. We have all kinds of unlimited minutes given to us or how often. We can freely express what's on our mind. Uh, we can express what makes us afraid what makes us anxious, what makes us sad, knowing that Jehovah is listening and that he will act with mercy and help us at the right time. Faith in Jehovah and Jesus also helps us to realize that they want to forgive us, they want to help us. How can we be sure, absolutely confident? Notice what Psalm 86 and verse five says, it reassures us, for you, O Jehovah, are good, and notice, and ready to forgive. You abound in loyal love for all those who call on you. Did you notice that Jehovah is ready to forgive? Yes, why? Because of his loyal love, his attachment to his people. He is already prepared to pardon our sins if and when we fall, even committing serious sins. This gives us the confidence to approach Jehovah, to know that he's listening, that he will forgive us, and that we can continue to run with a clean conscience, and we can improve. Jehovah has also given us precious gifts and men, shepherds who can help us, especially when we need to recover from a spiritual sickness. Notice what James said in uh, the, the book bearing his name, James chapter 5, and we'll read verses 14 and 15. And as we find James chapter 5, notice the question that is posed in verse 14. Is there anyone sick among you? If so, what would take place? Well, it says, let him call the elders of the congregation to him and let them pray over him applying oil to him in the name of Jehovah. And what will happen as a result of these loving elders taking attention and caring for the sheep? Verse 15 says, And the prayer of faith will make the sick one well, and Jehovah will raise him up. Also, if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Again, how comforting this is for any of us going through difficult times, where we need help spiritually. When we experience such mercy, such compassion from Jehovah and Jesus, we want to imitate them and extend mercy, forgiveness, compassion to those who sinned against us, those who hurt us. The second area that we want to cover is how does Jesus help us to overcome a second potential roadblock when we suffer the loss of a loved one? When we lose a loved one in death, 
possibly our mate, our child, um, a parent, another close relative or friend. It's like losing our running partner. We wonder, how can we keep running alone without their support, without their strength, without their inspiration? Well, remember, we're not running alone. We have this bit of reassurance in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Let's read this together. We are not running alone. Who is running right alongside of us? Hebrews 2 and verse 17 reads, Consequently, he had to become like his brothers in all respects so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in things relating to God in order to offer a propitiatory sacrifice for the sins of the people. Since he himself has suffered when being put to the test, notice he is able to come to the aid of those who are being put to the test. Jesus was tested to the limit. He knows how we feel. He knows how to help us. He experienced all the things that we're going through today. Tiredness, persecution, trials, pain, and even death. He wants to help us. He understands how to help us. In effect, he says, I know what you're going through. I know how to get you up off the ground, and I will help you by coming to your aid. I will run with you so you can run the race successfully. And we recall how he helped pre-Christians and those Christians, anointed ones in the Bible. He was right there at their side when they fell, picked them up, and was able to help them carry on. Uh, there's a few examples that we want to relate. And you might remember this one, the widow of Nain. Uh, this widow already experienced the death of her husband, but now she experienced the death of her only son, her only means of support. Jesus saw her pain. He felt her pain in his heart. And he wanted to remove that pain. And that's exactly what he did. Out of love, moved with pity, he said to her, Stop weeping. Then he approached her son and said, Young man, I say to you, get up. Yes, he resurrected her son, reunited their family. Can you imagine the joy of all those who were present? What about those grieving the death of Lazarus? Now, Jesus said that he is the resurrection and the life. Yet when he saw Mary and the others weeping, what did he do? As we recall, he groaned within himself and he became troubled. And then he gave way to tears. Now, he knew that he could fix their pain, their suffering, but he felt their pain in his heart. Moved with love, moved with compassion, he relieved their pain by resurrecting Lazarus to life. Now again, imagine the joy of all those who were present, including Jesus. The man full of leprosy, what do you recall about him? He said to Jesus, Lord, if you just want to, you can, be, you can make me clean. He knew that Jesus had the power to heal him, but what he really wanted to know was, did, you, did Jesus really have the desire? Did he really want to help this man? Well, we know the answer. Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and actually touched the man that was full of leprosy, and he said, I want to be made clean. And immediately, this leprosy vanished. So the man that was full of leprosy was now full of joy. Again, everyone present was so happy to see this and experience this. These examples show that our chief shepherd, Jesus, cares about us. He cared about his sheep in the past as well as present. But what is he doing today to care for us? He's not performing miracles right now or miraculous cures, at least not yet. But he is providing something to keep us joyful, to keep us enduring. He's giving us gifts in men, the elders. Over 700,000 worldwide are here for us, to encourage us, 
to help us serve Jehovah faithfully. They're not performing miracles today, but they are doing something miraculous. They're strengthening us. They're following the advice at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14, where it says, Speak consolingly to those who are depressed or discouraged. Support the weak and be patient toward all. That describes our elders and all the congregations around the world. Now, many of our brothers and sisters are facing very difficult circumstances. No doubt you are, or you have over the last year. Some have had to endure natural disasters, warfare, crime, violence, injustice, or illness. Some very life-threatening types of health problems. Our elders were there every step of the way to support us, to help us endure. Here's a couple of examples. In the southern part of the United States, there was a widowed pioneer sister who was tying into the Zoom meeting like we've all been doing. And it was during one of the worst winter storms this past year. During the meeting, she unmuted herself and called out, Brothers, my house is flooding. What should I do? Minutes later, two elders showed up along with the ministerial servants as they went through the treacherous icy roads to her home. They were able to cut off the gushing water from the broken pipe. They were able to, to remove the water from their home and then have her furniture moved out of the way so it was not damaged. The very next morning, they showed up with their tools. They repaired the broken pipe and they were able to make sure our sister was safe and secure. She appreciates so much the loving attention of the elders in her congregation, much like the elders in your congregation. Now, many other elders serve on the Disaster Relief Committee or the Hospital Liaison Committee, and they provide material support, physical support, as well as spiritual support. Here's an example. In Congo, Kinshasa, recently there was intense fighting that broke out. The Disaster Relief Committee assisted over 1,500 brothers and sisters who were in desperate need of help. Now, sadly, during this conflict, two of our brothers lost their lives. The elders did their best to bring comfort to all 1,500, but especially to the widows of our two brothers who suddenly lost their lives. As you can imagine, the elders had to go through some very dangerous areas to help those 1,500 brothers and sisters. How did they feel about it? They said it brought them great joy that they could be able to give some joy and happiness and provide for their fellow brothers and sisters who were in distress. One brother who received relief said this, Coping with war made me discouraged and hopeless. But the help I received from the elders strengthened my conviction that nothing can separate me from Jehovah's love. How beautiful. What a nice expression. Here's another example of how the elders support us. One brother who went through a medical emergency expressed how much he appreciated the help from the elders and how his family benefited from that, as well as the hospital liaison committee. He said, one elder called each day to make sure we knew that he was available. And if needed, he could be there for any medical issue or anything that would come up. His calm manner brought so much peace to the family during such a stressful time. When my care became critical, another elder came at 3 a.m. in the morning to the emergency room and waited in the parking lot with my family since they could not enter the hospital due to COVID restrictions. This elder brought real comfort to me and my family and kept us strong spiritually. That same elder was also the last person each evening to communicate with my family before they went to sleep. He continued to assure them that he was available at a moment's notice if anything was needed. The brothers took the time to say prayers by the phone with me and my family every day. The elders also provided support in the way of groceries and meals weeks after I returned home. 
when we think about these elders, we think about our, our loving high priest and King Jesus and how the elders are following his footsteps to our benefit. The third area, how does Jesus help us to overcome our third potential roadblock when we are pressured to compromise our faith? While running on the road to life, we are guaranteed to run into somebody with road rage. Yes, they will use intimidating words. They will threaten us with violence, prison, or even death. Anything to pressure us to compromise our faith, to stop following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. So what should we do when we are confronted with such roadblocks, such hurdles, test of our faith? Well, we need to look intently at Jesus. How did he handle suffering, pressure, and such roadblocks? Notice what the Apostle Paul said at Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 through 9. It says, During his life on earth, Christ offered up supplications and also petitions. And notice how, with strong outcries and tears to the one who was able to save him out of death. And he was favorably heard for his godly fear. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. And after he had been made perfect, he became responsible for everlasting salvation to all those obeying him. What do we learn as we look intently at our high priest, Jesus, our King, and what he went through, the suffering, the trials? We learn that he did not rely on himself, his own strength, his own abilities. No, he looked to Jehovah. We read there that he offered up supplications, petitions, with strong outcries and tears. His prayers were intense. He knew that Jehovah was going to hear him, and he knew that he could rely on Jehovah. Jesus knows what it means to be favorably heard as a human. He knows what it means to receive strength and protection and comfort from Jehovah. He knows that that's the best thing that we need to do when we are confronted with such pressure. In fact, we know that Jehovah comforted Jesus on at least more than one uh, occasion when angels came down to comfort him. So we should feel free to go to Jehovah in prayer, tell him our fears, our worries, our anxieties, knowing that he will hear us and he will help us to remain faithful and endure. You might recall this example from the 2016 yearbook that contains a beautiful reminder of what it means to remain faithful to Jehovah. And this is from Brother Andre Elias, a courageous pioneer from Indonesia, who stood firm in the face of pressure to compromise his faith. Andre faithfully endured harsh treatment in prison, and whatever happened to him, he never gave in to the prison guards or any other pressures thrust upon him. When his wife was finally able to visit him in prison, this is what he said as he whispered through the bars of his prison cell. Do not worry. Whether they kill me or set me free, I will remain faithful to Jehovah. They can carry me out as a corpse, but not as a traitor. Amazing. His determination in the face of such pressure. Well, he endured faithfully and was eventually released. But fast forward 30 years later, the work was banned in Indonesia, and a government official asked Andre, Do you know that Jehovah's Witnesses are banned? Andre said, Yes, of course I do. Then the official asked him, Are you now prepared to change your religion? Andre leaned forward and dramatically beat his chest, said this, You can tear my heart away from my body, but you can never make me change my religion. Andre was dismissed and they never bothered him again because of his 
faith in Jehovah, his reliance on Jehovah's power and his determination. In the year 2000, he eventually died, and uh, at the age of 85, after 60 years of faithful pioneer service, we look back at this man as a good example. But what helped Andre run the race to the finish? What helped him to endure? Uh, no doubt, it was looking intently at the example of Jesus and how he endured his suffering, his trials. He also looked to examples in the Bible that were faith-strengthening to him, such as the Apostle Paul. Uh, we know that the Apostle Paul endured so much suffering, many trials, a lot of pressure was put upon him to compromise his faith. But Paul knew that Jesus was at his side and would never leave him. And that gave him the faith, the confidence to continue to move forward and faithfully serve in his capacity. Notice his firm determination at 2 Timothy chapter 4, the letter that Paul penned to faithful Timothy. 2 Timothy 4, notice there in verse 6. It says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my releasing is imminent. But notice his determination, which should be our determination. I have fought the fine fight. I have run the race to the finish. I have observed the faith. We think about Paul. We think about someone who is a great example for us. He continued despite any roadblocks that were put before him. Yes, our compassionate king and high priest Jesus stood by Paul, stood by Andre, and will continue to stand by all of us as we continue to observe the faith and continue to run the race to the finish. How about our fourth area? How does Jesus help us to overcome potential roadblock? Doubts. Doubts are like tall hurdles that are placed before our course, our path. Now, if we don't overcome these hurdles, they will overcome us. They will weaken our faith preventing us from making forward spiritual progress and even come between ourselves and Jehovah. It may even prevent us from receiving the reward for those who do reach the finish line. Satan knows very well that doubts work. He's been using them for centuries on angels as well as humans. So if it works, why not continue to use it, right? So he will continue to put doubts in front of us, like hurdles. Uh, he tries to undermine our faith and love in Jehovah and his promises, even promises of the rewards for the future. He tries to plant seeds of doubts that Jehovah doesn't really love us. He doesn't really want to have a relationship with us or draw close to us. What will help us to overcome such distracting doubts and continue focusing on the road ahead of us and the race that we are in. Notice what the Apostle Paul says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. He says, Moreover, without faith it is impossible to please God well. For whoever approaches God must believe that he is and that he becomes the rewarder of those earnestly seeking him. So what was Paul telling us? The only way that we can please Jehovah is by having a strong faith. And having that strong faith will motivate us to continue to draw close to him, continue to approach him, continue to earnestly seek him. Not having any doubts that he loves us, he will protect us, and he will reward us. Now, as we know, Satan tried to put all kinds of hurdles, roadblocks in front of Jesus. He tried to put pressure on him when he was at his weakest physically. But Jesus set the perfect example of integrity, kept his faith strong, never gave any shape or form into doubts. He never allowed doubts to take root in his mind or heart. As we know, Satan will continue to try to undermine and weaken our faith 
try to put doubts in front of us. But much like coaches train their runners to jump over hurdles, even at top speeds, we know that Jesus is training us now to overcome any types of hurdles that Satan puts in front of us to help us move forward just as he helped our faithful brothers and sisters, the runners from the past, to run a successful race. Do you recall what helped the Apostle Peter to overcome his weak faith and his doubts? As we recall, when Peter and the other disciples were rowing a boat at night, they were struggling because it was in the middle of a storm. And right then and there, they see Jesus in front of them walking on the water. When they saw it, they became afraid. Let's read what happens next. Let's go to Matthew chapter 14. This account intrigues me as well as you because it really impacts us on Jesus' ability to make us courageous despite fear. In Matthew chapter 14, there in verse 27, Jesus told them to take courage and not to be afraid. Then, verse 28, Peter said, Lord, if it is you, he knew it was him, but if it is you, uh, command me to come to you over the waters. And then Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked over the waters and went toward Jesus. But looking at the windstorm, he became afraid. And when he started to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And then immediately stretching out his hand, Jesus caught hold of him and said to him, you with little faith. Why did you give way to doubt? So we have a couple of questions to ask about this account. Um, how did Peter show faith? Well, obviously, he showed faith by getting out of the boat and walking on water. Uh, he knew that Jehovah's Spirit, uh, his power, was able to have Jesus walk on the water. So he figured with that strong faith at first, he could do the same. So what happened? What went wrong? Why did Peter become afraid and begin to sink? Because he started to focus on what was happening around him. He was distracted by the storm. This revealed a weakness in his faith, and that weakness eventually led to doubt. But what helped Peter to regain his faith and overcome and remove doubt? Well, he was a fisherman, so he likely was a pretty good swimmer. So he could have just swam back to the boat on his own. But what did he do instead? He quickly refocused from the windstorm and looked intently at Jesus. He allowed Jesus to help him. What's the lesson for you and for me? Well, if we sense that our faith is weakening and that we're giving way to doubts in any shape or form, we need to follow Peter's example. Stop looking at things that could be distracting to us, things that are storms in our life, and refocus, look intently on Jesus. Trust in him. Trust in our God Jehovah and his power. Look at Jesus. See how he walks, his example, and then walk the walk. The Jews in Berea served as really good examples for all of us who want to strengthen ourselves, build our faith, and have a strong hope for the future. What did they do? Something we want to do. Notice Acts chapter 17, and we'll start with verse 11. Acts 17, verse 11. It says, Now these, the Bereans, were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they accepted the word with the greatest eagerness of mind. How did they do this? They carefully examined the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And because they did that, verse 12 says, many of them became believers. How do we overcome doubts? Well, we need to follow the example of the Bereans by carefully examining the scriptures daily. Investigate its many prophecies, how Jehovah made these things come true. Investigate these. Do research. Use the tools that Jehovah's organization has given us, the spiritual food provided by the faithful and discreet slave. 
And if we still have some lingering doubts, what can we do? We can turn to our loving elders or our parents to help us. As we have considered these four roadblocks, has it strengthened your faith to know that Jesus and Jehovah are there to help us? What were those four? Uh, when we commit a sin, when we suffer the loss of a loved one, when we're pressured to compromise our faith, or when we have doubts. With the help of Jehovah's powerful Holy Spirit and our King and High Priest Jesus, we know that any roadblock that's put ahead of us, before us, we know that we can overcome it and we can continue to run forward if we put up a hard fight for the faith. Yes, today's Circuit Assembly program really did strengthen our faith. It gave us many practical ways that we can do so. Now, here's the hard part. We need to apply these. We need to put these into practice. And in our program, uh, there were so many things, and I'm sure you took a lot of notes, but let's just review a few of the things that were discussed. And we want to thank all the brothers and sisters who were a part of this program. Uh, but in the first talk, Brother Lucioni helped us to appreciate why we need to strengthen our faith now. It's because we know our faith will be tested, so we need to strengthen it now to face those events in the future. Brother Southern answered the question, do you see the one who is invisible? He pointed out that we can figuratively see Jehovah by coming to know him well. And this includes knowing his personality and then obeying him. We enjoyed hearing from Brother Fisher's talk, Faith Follows the Things Heard, where we learned it's good for us to examine Bible prophecies. It strengthens us, helps us to share zealously these truths with others. And then Brother Flodine had the talk, The Fruitage of the Spirit is Faith. And he reminded us that we need faith. And it comes from Jehovah's Holy Spirit. So praying for Holy Spirit can help us recall Bible teachings and guide us in the way that Jehovah approves. And then we had the last symposium, Help Others to Strengthen Their Faith. Brothers Colquist, Raggetts, and Clark. They helped us to see that we can help others. Uh, teenagers, Bible students, and fellow believers. We do so by patiently listening to them and encouraging them with God's word. So we have our review question. Why should we look intently at the chief agent and perfecter of our faith? Well, the answer is found in Hebrews chapter 2, chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. Let's read verse 3. We already read verse 2. We need to look intently at Jesus. But verse 3 says, Consider closely the one who has endured such hostile speech from sinners against their own interests, so that you may not get tired and give up. So the answer, we need to look at Jesus. He will help us to resist pressure, overcome doubts, endure trials, and recover when we commit a sin. So just as a professional athlete looks for ways to improve his game and looks to those who have the experience, we look for ways to strengthen our faith to look for ways to increase our spiritual activity and to endure. Who do we look to? We look to the perfect example. We look to Jesus, our chief agent and perfecter of our faith. Following in his footsteps, we will never get tired. We will never give up. But we will run with endurance the race that is set before us, faithful to the end.